we're live. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Um, it's great to see so many of you who have already lined up uh, for today's stream. It's uh, I was just reading Nigel's comment and had hysterics <laughs> to myself. Um, yes, an excuse to tell your boss as to why you're unavailable for an hour every afternoon. Hmm. <laughs> I think that um, skills training, as David suggests, is a very good excuse or, you know, um, this is, can't really be called an hour of educational time. It could be called an hour of personal development or something like that. Um, very much look forward to seeing some of your shots that you're all sending over to me, both by email and on the drive. Please do continue to do that. Hello to everyone who has joined so far. Um, really nice to, to have you with us this afternoon. I think it is a bit chilly out. I have not left the house since yesterday, so I don't know, but, um, but I will go out later. Um, we were talking yesterday about film photography. So the first note that I have that I must not forget to mention is the photography competition that we have on the drive folder right now, um, which very clearly says competition uh, and it's the film photography competition. So if you haven't, some of you have already uploaded photos there, which is is fantastic already. I mean, within a few hours, there were there were pictures um, on there. So please do add your pictures. Um, maybe because the competition doesn't finish until next Friday, uh, Friday, <laughs> um, perhaps wait until the day before or thereabouts before you leave a comment. Um, if you want to hold on to your vote, because obviously you can comment on everybody's pictures, but I am going to count those comments as votes. That's not a problem either. But anyway, so today we're talking about uh, servicing your camera and also AF fine tuning. Uh, I have had a few questions posted directly to me as comments, and I thought, actually, this makes a great topic for a stream because people don't always know, first of all, where to get their camera serviced. And I will put links to the places that I mention uh, at the end of the stream, but also what requires a service and what is something that you could potentially fix yourself. Um, that's where AF fine tuning comes in. And I will talk about that a little bit in, in due course. So looking at my notes here, Oh no, I have another note. <laughs> I must have forget the note. Um, Super Chat. So a few of you asked, how do I donate to Super Chat? This is for the coffee fund. So how do you um, add to the coffee fund? There is a dollar sign at the side of the dialogue that you can actually use. Um, if you haven't got the ability to use the dollar sign, it's just because you need to sign up for YouTube and make sure you're a subscriber. So if you haven't been able to do that, um, so far you can. We're also experimenting with a very good idea that someone suggested uh, that we actually have a product on our shop called Coffee Fund so that you can donate even if you're not watching the stream live. Um, we're all a bunch of caffeine addicts <laughs> at the shop. Um, but even for those that don't drink coffee, um, whether it's a cup of tea or a hot chocolate or a hot cross bun or something, it's always nice to know that you, you're sort of appreciating that we're putting these things on for you and that um, you're getting something out of it. So thank you to everybody who has so far done a super chat um, contribution. That's the word I wanted to look for there. Um, and you are welcome to do it as I talk to you today. Uh, yes, I just want to very quickly answer because I was talking about the competition. Richard asked any tips on converting old negatives in the house? Yes. Okay. This could be a whole stream in itself, but I did do a video on the ES2 slide and strip film copier. Not sure if... Um, I didn't go into the editing that much on the video. I did mention it a little bit, but I didn't talk about the, the actual editing side in depth. Essentially what you have to do, and this is a quick aside, if you've got Lightroom, uh, Nikon software, uh, anything like that, if you're gonna copy your negatives, whether you're gonna do it with an ES2 or an ES1, or you're just gonna get a light box, for example, or I use <laughs> really cheeky, um, you can use even a sort of like LED light, one that is smooth and doesn't show the individual dots of LEDs, for example, and place the strip of film on top of it and photograph it, you can actually then still convert those negatives. But the best option is always just to do it um, with the ES2, which I'm, I'm a big fan of. They're out of stock at the moment, so we've got a few back orders um, at the shop. But if you've got one already, you can do it in camera with a D850, a D7, 80 is the other camera you can do it with in camera. Um, otherwise, 
in Lightroom, Photoshop, Nikon software, anything like that, when you've got a picture of a negative up on the screen, all you've got to do is reverse the curves graph. So you've got that black point and the white point and you're just reversing them. Um, and if you do that, that will convert your negative to positive and then you will have to play a little bit about with white balance and things like that. There is also um, a piece of software that you can buy that I think, or sorry, download, which is free, which is called, I think, Negative Lab. Um, if I can find the link to that, I'll put that at the bottom of the video. Now, uh, Hello from Norway, uh, Ivar. I'm really glad <laughs> that you like the talks about the Nikkor manual lenses. Um, you may make a composition including only pictures taken with those lenses in the future. Uh, the competition that's on now, because it's a film photography competition, you are welcome to post pictures taken with manual lenses if you like. Perhaps uh, I can do a competition to do with just manual lenses on digital cameras in the future, so that's a very good suggestion. Um, and yes, so now we're going to talk about the servicing, which was the topic of today's stream. If you are wanting to get a, a Nikon product, like a digital product serviced, uh, the Nikon Service Centre is now in the UK. It is in Surbiton. They moved from Kingston. For anyone who doesn't know, they moved in December. And the service centre in Kingston um, used to allow you to walk in and drop your equipment off. They don't do that now anymore. A very good tip if you are London or UK based is you take it to the Nikon School. The Nikon School is um, a favourite place of mine. There are some lovely, lovely people working there. Um, and MPS are also operating out of there um, to a large degree as well as them running their courses and workshops. And the Nikon School is located just behind Oxford Circus uh, on a street called Margaret, Margaret Street. So if you are in London and you want to go and look at Nikon equipment or you want to drop it off in person for repair, you can take it to the Nikon School and they'll book it in for you. So that's become their new kind of front desk, as it were, for servicing. It then gets taken to Surbiton where they have their workshop and their offices. They don't have a customer um, kind of desk at the Surbiton branch anymore. So you don't go to Nikon in the same way that you used to. That changed back in December. So for anyone who doesn't know, that is for official Nikon repairs. There are certain products that only Nikon will repair themselves, such as Coolpixes and sometimes bodies like um, the Zeds. Although now, so the, the other service centre, official Nikon service centre in the UK is Fixation, who some of you might know are owned by the WEX photo video group. They used to be independent and then they, they were bought in by WEX. Now, um, uh, Fixation have worked with us for a long, long time and we used to send all our repairs there, but now Nikon are sort of doing a courier service for us. So we now send all our repairs to Nikon for the most part. Fixation unlike Nikon, are still open for servicing and repairs. So if you're in an absolute pickle right now, the second, and you need your camera repaired, um, get in touch with Fixation because they will still do some servicing. They have a technician um, who can still do stuff right now. Um, but just in general, Fixation are great. You can walk in there. Obviously, they do sales as well. They sell things um, that aren't Nikon related. They sell all brands because they're Wex. They have tripods and bags and everything else. Um, and the staff there are also very friendly and knowledgeable. It's a little bit more um, of a kind of clinical place. If you look at the shop and then you look at other camera shops, it is all sort of hard surfaces and glass countertops and stuff like that. So that's the kind of experience. And it is also a little bit like a TARDIS in that you have to walk through a door in a wall and then suddenly it's... <laughs> It's a camera shop inside um, and they have a few floors with different uh, things. They do rentals, they do repairs and then they also have their sales section. So if you want to go somewhere and get your sensor cleaned while you wait or you want a, a repair done and you want to physically drop your equipment in and speak to someone when you do that, then you go to fixation. Um, if you, um, I'm going to just, yes, exactly. The links are appearing as I speak, just like magic, modern technology. Um, so that's fixation. Now, the one thing that Nikon and fixation both cannot do, um, and Nikon with a few um, exceptions, but otherwise cannot do, is film camera repairs. And this has always been a little bit of a bone of contention for a lot of people because they have these beautiful cameras that they've had for years and then they can't get the, the lenses serviced or the cameras fixed. Obviously, there are some parts which are very, very hard to get hold of um, with the Nikon F Photomic and the Nikon F2 uh, Photomic heads, for example. There's a certain part of those 
which which goes wrong, which is called the carbon track, they usually end up um, stripping down and then you can't get replacements for them. So if you've got older camera bodies, unfortunately it's very difficult to get those serviced and repaired. If, um, as I was mentioning yesterday, uh, just, you know, demonstration here, um, if you've got a camera that just needs the light seals replaced, so the, the foam mirror baffle in your film camera and the light seals in the back of the camera, that can be done by several different workshops. Um, the one in London that we sometimes use is called Sendine Camera Repairs, um, and they are, I believe, based in Clerkenwell. They, if you have something wrong with your camera, I mean, film camera, and it doesn't have to be a Nikon brand, it can be anything, they will find another camera to cannibalize parts from to fix your cherished possession. I mean, we had um, a 35 Ti, which you may have heard of. It's a little compact 35 mil titanium camera that Nikon made. Absolutely beautiful piece of machinery, but the lens had gotten jammed on it, which is next to impossible to get fixed and Sendine managed to fix it. So that was um, nothing short of a miracle. I'm getting there, John, <laughs> I'm getting there. So that's Sendine for even the more obscure things. Obviously they will do um, foam replacement and they will um, you know, clean fungus out of lenses and things like that. But if you have something really tricky in terms of a film camera, um, then Sendine is a good place to go. Uh, we also use, for more sort of easy to handle repairs that don't require complicated parts, we also use a camera called, uh, sorry, a company called PJ Camera Repairs. They're based up um, north, <laughs> north of where I am, north of London, uh, Newcastle over somewhere. Um, so they will do things like foam replacement, relubricating lenses, cleaning aperture blades and getting fungus out of lenses when it hasn't gotten too drastic. And that's the next thing I'm going to talk about is when it's drastic and it needs repair and when it's just a simple fix. They also do digital equipment. So if you need something that doesn't specifically require a Nikon technician, uh, PJ camera repairs do those as well. They don't touch things like uh, compact cameras, but they will... For example, I think we had a, uh, I think it was a D300 or something with a scratched mirror and they fixed that. So there's there's odd bits and pieces which you can get done from there. You know, if you need a new sensor or a new shutter, you send it to Nikon um, or fixation. But if you just need something fairly straightforward or, or you've got film equipment that needs a straightforward service, then PJ uh, camera repairs will do that for you and the link has just appeared in the in the chat there thank you david thank you so much yay for your um contribution to the coffee fund any and all contributions to the coffee fund are welcome i have not had enough coffee today so um please do feel to contribute it is my um now eight-year-old's eight-year-old birthday um which is an interesting experience and he was up at 6 30 so i definitely need the coffee <laughs> so if you if you want to contribute to the coffee fund please just click the old super chat it's on that side for you i forget that it's reversed but um please do click the icon um right so that's uh nikon fixation sendine and pjs now um, as John mentioned earlier, Sova Wong, who has been doing F2, specifically F2 camera repairs, that's his specialty. He does do other film cameras as well, but the F2 is kind of his forte. Um, he's phenomenal and he will repair your F2 um, without much difficulty. So, yay! Robert, thank you! <laughs> <laughs> so enthusiastic about the coffee but thank you so much for your contribution to the coffee fund that is very very appreciated <laughs> i hope you find my random outbursts quite entertaining um yes yeah, so sober wong if you have an f2 will do that for you um he also does f uh, fm bodies and the fe series and possibly some of the fa's he does do other cameras he is known as um the f2 repairman and i pretty sure his website is something like f2repairs.co.uk um, but he's been doing it for a very long time so if you have a prized f2 that you need repairing um, you can very comfortably place it in his hands if you need um, foam replacements and things like that he also does that for other film cameras to my knowledge so those are the main places that both we recommend and that we also go to um, Someone asked me the other day, so I will mention it. There is a company that specializes 
in infrared conversions, which is very different and a very specialized uh, thing in itself. You have to have a camera where you take the sensor and you remove the, um, the infrared protective filter off the top of the sensor. So you don't want to just give that to anyone. The company is called Advanced Camera Services. Um, that is their thing. Um, so if you want an infrared conversion done and you want to turn one of your cameras into an infrared camera, then um, ACS or Advanced Camera Service is the place to go. So that's in terms of where to go. Now, in terms of why you would go there, this uh, is something that someone mentioned to me. So what's worth getting repaired? What's not worth getting repaired? Obviously, if you drop your camera, it's a good idea to get it checked out. Um, some cameras will survive being a little bit more beaten up than other cameras and I don't ever recommend you drop your camera <laughs> so don't try to drop it just to see what will happen. Um, I've had situations myself where I've only ever once dropped camera um, and it was not my fault <laughs> I will say. I passed it to someone and they went to take it and unfortunately I let it go before I realized they hadn't taken it and my D300 uh, fell to a hardwood floor and the lens fell apart into about six different pieces and was a complete write-off. But the camera itself was completely fine, miraculously completely fine. However, when you drop a camera, wow, look at that. <laughs> Thank you, um, Gary. I'm confused about this uh, this Super Chat donation. There's like a 199 and a five pounds in there. It's amazing. Thank you so much uh, for that. That's great. Um, I, I don't even understand how that happened. Well, anyway. <laughs> fantastic so if you drop your camera or your lens or anything like that when you drop a camera it does move tiny parts usually of the autofocus system that's the first thing um, that usually suffers a little bit if you drop it um, there are obviously other things now sometimes people can get a little bit snobbish about putting filters on their lenses um, and for those that don't want to put a piece of glass on the front of your beautifully you know expensive optics I understand but also the filter can help you from getting things like scratches on your lens or occasionally when you drop a lens which you shouldn't but if you do the filter sometimes takes the hit so the filter will smash but the lens itself will be perfect and I have seen that far too many times to count um, the 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 filters that have the sort of spring loaded glass inside uh, they kind of rattle a little bit when you put them on so you may think well it's a it's not as robust but it usually means that the glass will take the impact rather than the lens itself you do get filters which are very robust which are solidly welded into their frames I've yet to see one of those shatter um, so perhaps it's something to do with the design of the loose glass in the metal frame that, that causes it to break if you drop your lens that that's my thinking but um, if you do drop something obviously always check that it works yourself but if you have any doubts you can take it to one of these places that's a big obvious one if you drop it in the sea unfortunately uh, or a river I mean that's happened too many times unfortunately to people who are very adventurous um, and then go and drop their camera in some water cameras and things don't like um, being dropped in water understandably uh, Nick points out the lens hood is also a great first barrier so if you are a uh, an, a user of lens hoods I'm terrible I don't use a lens hood but I do use a filter um, but lens hood is another way to protect the front of your lens obviously if you scratch your front element if you scratch this piece of glass here um, rather than a filter, it is far more expensive to get that fixed than it is just to take a filter off and put a new filter on. Um, there are the big lenses like the 302.8, actually 200 f2, 302.8, 4, 5, 6, 7, sorry, no 7, 800 millimeter lenses. Um, they actually have a filter built into the lens, which Nikon and you with a bit of brute force, but Nikon can actually replace for you. And those are a little bit more expensive than your normal filters because they're so big. Um, but that is actually a first form of protection for those bigger lenses because obviously those actually have the, um, the filter in the rear of the lens. So if you've got a big lens, then don't worry that you can't screw a filter onto it because it's actually already got a filter on there. If you've got a smaller lens that does take a filter thread, this one for example is 95 millimeter, so this is a big one, um, then do put a uh, filter on the front just for that extra bit of protection. Get a good filter, 
don't buy a cheap nasty filter from from you know ebay or something that isn't a genuine one just for the simple reason that you will get more flare you may get slightly softer images particularly if it's not high quality glass um oh thank you marco yay <laughs> i'm doing well today everyone wants me very hyped up on caffeine <laughs> no i really appreciate it thank you so much um so with that's with the filters obviously if you haven't put a filter on you've dropped your lens get it checked out the other common point to get serviced is a sensor clean now when i change lenses except for when i'm doing demonstrations I usually tend to hold my camera, make sure your camera's turned off. This is like, you know, photography 101. Make sure your camera's turned off and hold your camera down when you change lenses so that you don't let any dust get in there. Obviously some lenses, they move, the internal elements move and none of them are 100% airtight. So they will put a little bit of dust onto into your camera, unfortunately. I'm just gonna um, probably have to get my camera sense clean soon anyway. But when you leave the camera exposed for any length of time, you will need to get a sensor clean. Full frame sensors are horrendous for accumulating dust, um, more so than DX sensors. DX I've managed to uh, get, I mean, I've managed to have DX cameras for years and not have to get them cleaned more than once every three or four years. Full frame bodies tend to kind of, because it's a bigger area, you do end up with more dust on them. So a sensor clean is something that I wouldn't necessarily, unless you've had some kind of training on it before, don't attempt it yourself. Particularly don't attempt it yourself if your camera is still under warranty. If your camera is still under warranty and you clean your own sensor, you will automatically void your warranty. So for that time period, um, just get it cleaned by a proper service center. Nikon and Fixation are the obvious choices, but there are other companies, camera companies, for example, that do sensor cleaning, um, which, I mean, some are better than others, but I would say Nikon and Fixation are the way to go. Uh, Marco tells me not to abuse the caffeine. I won't, <laughs> thank you. I have a limit um, of how much coffee I can drink in a day. Um, and when it comes to the coffee fund, it is for all the staff, not just for me, <laughs> just so you know. So it's not just everyone's gonna be making me drink lots of coffee. Um, now, does the new 120 to 300 allow a filter to be added? No, it is a rear filter and it has a built-in filter um, on the front. That is what I have read so far. We haven't seen the lens in person yet. We hopefully will by May, all being well, that's the idea, but yes. Um, I'm sorry my audio is only working on the left channel. I have it set up completely normal, so I'm not sure what's going on there, unless my microphone turned itself off. No, it hasn't, so I'm not sure. Sorry, can't fix that one. Um, yes, when you're using film, you get a new sensor every time, so you don't have to clean your sensor. <laughs> so sensor cleans, as I say, do um, take it to a proper service center while your camera is under warranty, just so you don't void your warranty. Um, after that, Sensor cleaning can be very difficult. It can be very easy depending on your level of confidence and your level of skill. The cameras themselves have a built-in sensor clean function, which essentially means that the sensor vibrates um, a little bit to shake off any dust and dirt. Unfortunately, if you've got wet dust or you've been you know, somewhere where you've got lots of condensation and things like that, um, you will end up needing a wet sensor clean, which is a proper sensor clean. So that's a thing to do and to take to a service center. Um, now, Nick points out that fish eyes don't have front filters. 1424s don't have front filters. There's a few lenses where you've got like a domed front element and you can't put a filter on them. That Those are obviously lens specific. When it comes to getting lenses cleaned, this was the next thing I wanted to talk about. So um, autofocus lenses are obviously fairly straightforward. You can usually tell if they need a service because they will start to make a strange noise. AFS lenses um, usually don't make any noise and they shouldn't really when you're turning the focusing ring. The older manual, a not manual, the older autofocus D lenses do make a kind of scraping noise anyway when you rotate the focus ring. Um, but the manual focus lenses can either be dry or they can be quite solid. Let me get the old 200, here we go. So this one is quite a smooth um, 
smooth focus. If it's really dry, then it will be loose and sloppy, and then I should get it serviced if that were the case. In contrast, my 105 2.5 is very stiff. Well, it's not very stiff, it's a little bit stiff, so at some point it probably needs to be loosened up. Um, so things like that you can get serviced. The thing that you have to get serviced as soon as you see it in any item of equipment that you have is fungus, because fungus comes from um, storing your equipment in a slightly damp location. You may not even realize that your camera bag maybe got a bit wet when you went walking, um, or you may be storing your equipment somewhere near an, outs an exterior wall and the um, atmosphere is just a very encouraging for fungus kind of atmosphere. So if you see these little sort of spider webby marks and it can just be very, very tiny, the start of it's very tiny and it looks a little bit like very fine spider webs inside your lens, um, then absolutely please do get it serviced as soon as possible because fungus spreads. Um, if you, so sometimes we get people who have, um, I'd say inherited older equipment or they've dug it out from the archive somewhere or they found it in the loft or something. Um, and quite often, unless it's been kept with lots of silica gel, silica gel needs to be replaced by the way every few months. So silica gel is good up to a point, but it does need to be um, replaced or dried out and um, refreshed. So that's when you wanna check through your lenses that you haven't got any fungus or anything like that. Dust, now I could I could have you know a mountain of dust inside this lens and I wouldn't necessarily be able to see anything on the image. I could have a scratch on the front element and the only time I'd ever notice it is if I was shooting in bright sunlight. Luckily I don't, but if, if I did. However, if you have anything closer to the rear of the lens or a scratch on the rear element, then it starts to become much more noticeable on the pictures. Um, this is one of the reasons why oil on aperture blades, because the aperture is located so far back, when the oil eventually um, excretes onto the lens, it kind of melts, if you like, onto the, onto the glass, you will get very fuzzy pictures. Same with fungus. Fungus in the front of the lens you might not see. Fungus in the back of the lens you will definitely see on the images. Uh, so always worth checking when you've had equipment in storage for a little while or if you've had your camera bag in storage or you've been outside and you've gotten wet, your camera bag has gotten wet, just take all your equipment out and let the camera bag dry up before you um, put everything back in. Same with condensation. Sometimes you go out in the cold and then you go into the warm and you get misted up glass just let everything acclimatize don't try um, and do anything fancy with it until it's it's acclimatized to the change of temperature so if you've got fungus definitely do get it serviced um now i'm going to talk about what oh I've, oh paul hello <laughs> thank you thank you so much um that's another another contribution to the uh, to the super chat um, so yes, always keeping silica gel in your bags is a good idea, making sure that you refresh it. There is a way, I think someone is, in a few places they've put methods of refreshing your silica gel so you don't have to keep throwing the little bags away. Um, there are methods to do that and you can have a look online, but, but it's definitely worth doing that if you keep your stuff in storage for a long period of time or you don't have a kind of um, atmospherically controlled environment. So. One thing that I often get asked is, why is my lens, it's, you know, the camera says that the thing is in focus, but actually what's in focus is behind or in front of it. That is front or back focusing, depending on where it where it's focused. So you've got your object here, your camera is here, and then actually the camera says, beep, yep, it's in focus. And then when you look at the picture, it was the thing behind the subject or in front of the subject, which is actually clear on the picture. Um, that is a very common problem, but it's not a problem per se. <laughs> you can sort that out very simply yourself at home. There is a method um, that Nikon put in their instruction manuals and it's also available on their website, um, the instructions, but I'm gonna talk about them today. You can, also, if you don't want to AF fine tune your, your um, lenses, you can send everything off to Nikon or to fixation and they will recalibrate them. And what recalibrating essentially does is it tells the camera and the lens that um, this is zero, this, this point here is zero in terms of focusing. Um, so whereas the, the, um, the numbers dialed in might actually be slightly less or more than 
what real zero is. Zero is like the plane of focus. That's So the camera and the lens are seeing the same thing as the plane of focus. So it's just completely resetting that AF system, but for each other, because different lenses perform differently on different cameras and, and so on. Um, so why would you AF fine tune? If you're finding your pictures are just slightly not sharp or um, you are struggling with that, that hit or miss, slightly back focus, slightly front focus issue, um, if you don't want to send everything off for a calibration immediately, or you've got multiple lenses. Now, here's the problem with calibration. Nikon can only really calibrate one lens and one body. They can calibrate other lenses to the body, but if you've got um, one lens, for example, that is uh, perfect and the other lenses are not perfect, it's going to you could run the risk of throwing the perfect lens out by resetting the body for all the other lenses. So there's always there's always certainly a benefit to trying to AF fine tune yourself at home. So this is what we're going to um, go over today. Now, most professional cameras, not the not the little bodies, not the sort of 3000, 5000 series. Um, goodness me, Paul, thank you so much for your contribution to the coffee fund. Yay, there we go, a round of applause. Everybody give Paul a round of applause. <laughs> from home thank you <laughs> thank you very much um so the uh the nikon cameras that are i would say prosumer upwards not not the entry level cameras but the prosumer upwards so the d7000 series on up have a fine tuning you will find it in the setup menu menu okay so thanks to the green screen i have to highlight the one above but you've got setup menu. It's the first in the first list that comes up, and it's right at the bottom there where it says AF fine tuning. Now, even Z cameras have AF fine tune, but you should not need to AF fine tune your Z lenses to your Z camera. Um, the way that the AF system works is completely different. In fact. I don't really know that you should need to fine tune your F mount lenses unless your F mount lens is slightly wobbly on its calibration, like if it's been used a lot. Now what happens with lenses and cameras if they get picked up and put down and sort of schlepped about and chucked in the camera bag and whatever, parts will move and eventually you will need to, to get them recalibrated and serviced and you'll need everything reset. Um, if you're generally very careful with your equipment and it doesn't get a huge amount of use, it's unlikely that you will find lenses falling out of calibration over time. But if you've had a lens for a long time, I know a lot of working professionals who use, for example, the 24 to 70 2.8, it's a favorite, and the 70 to 200 2.8. Um, and after two or three years, they've been traveling around with these lenses um, and giving them a lot of use and eventually they slowly start to slip out of calibration so they get more and more back focusing or more and more front focusing and the quick fix for that is a fine tuning but ultimately if you've got a lens that you've had for a number of years or a decade or two or whatever um, and you're finding it's multiple um, multiple lenses on your body are all falling out of calibration just just go and get them recalibrated by Nikon that's the easiest thing to do but if you want to do a little AF fine tune at home you have one particularly fussy lens or you've got a bit of time on your hands as as everyone does at the moment um, then you can do this so you go to the AF fine tune menu you will need a focusing chart of some form it doesn't have to be fancy um, that I'm going to show you a screenshot in a minute of a fancy one. But here is an, a less than fancy one that I just printed out off the internet, um, if the green screen will, will not make it turn invisible. Um, this was from, uh, well, it's written by Tim Jackson, Tim at Focus Test Chart, so he created this. Um, and this is the kind of thing that we use generally. Now, it's no good to AF fine tune if you have this pinned up on your wall, <laughs> it's not going to help you at all. You have to have it at a slight angle. So I'm going to show you, I'm just going to switch my screen very quickly to show you an alternative focus chart. That is an alternative focus chart. And you see the kind of angle that has been laid out here. Now, Nikon um, on their website recommends something like the one I printed out, but to have it stuck at an angle like this. This one is a bit more fancy. This is the one that we have at the shop. Um, and you quite literally focus on the center target. And then this little ruler here shows you how much out of focus you are, either front or back focused. 
Um, now we have to talk about the method. Let me switch over so you can see me again. So the method for doing this is to take your focus chart and have it at a 45 degree angle approximately um, on a flat surface so that obviously it's a, it's a flat plane and you can see, because it's basically a ruler and you're going to focus on the middle and then the little incrementational um, lines here are going to tell you how much front or back focusing you have. Um, that is the the trick for for that. So once you've put your focusing chart on a surface at 45 degrees, make sure that you have the camera also stabilized. So ideally on a tripod. Uh, old school ruler also works fine. Honestly, before we got the fancy focusing chart in the shop, if we wanted to check things, we would use a ruler. It works. <laughs> so a ruler laid flat on a table, but then with the camera at an angle, so that you're you're seeing the different levels of back or front focusing is the um, is the way to go if you really can't print out a focusing chart or anything like that and you can't stick it on a board. But if you can, it just makes things a bit simpler. So essentially, you want to put this on a tripod or a very, very stable surface. Ideally use, um, because, because you're fine tuning a lens, you don't want vibrations in the camera you don't want to accidentally push the camera while you're in the middle of taking the shot and then find that the, the picture is blurry because of that. So um, a remote release or exposure delay mode, something like that is, is a really good idea. I would put it on a tripod, use a cable release or a remote release just to fire the shot. Because you're checking um, the amount of focus that you're out, you want to shoot at the widest aperture on your lens. So this, for example, is a 35 1.4. I would shoot at 1.4 because depth of field can disguise your front or back focusing. If I was shooting this lens at f8, I wouldn't notice any um, any front or back focusing. If um, I was shooting this lens at f32, I definitely wouldn't notice it. But at f1.4, I can clearly see the line on the focus chart where it's in focus and I can also see how much it's in or out of focus, hence shooting wide open. Um, another key point, uh, if you've got a lens with VR, turn the VR off because you're on a tripod and the VR is going to be vibrating, it's actually going to make your pictures look unsharp so that won't help. If you have a zoom, huh, this is a tricky thing, if you have a zoom you have to pick a focal length. Unfortunately you cannot AF fine tune for all of the focal lengths of the lens. So if you have a 70 to 200, for example, and you find it's worse at the 200 end than at the 70 end, um, then fine tune for the 200 end. Most people will fine tune dead in the middle, sort of 100, 105 or 135. And, and that's the kind of happy place where they can fine tune their lens and it will then kind of, the values will still apply to the other ends. That, that's a tricky one, but unfortunately even Nikon can't calibrate a zoom um, all across the focal lengths. They pick a happy medium when it comes to that. Uh, now, do you have AF fine tune lenses on the Z6? No, I did just mention that. You don't have to. Um, you, don't, you definitely don't have to fine tune Z lenses on the Z6. There is the facility to fine tune your F mount. I mean, you can fine tune any lens if you want to, but the F mount lenses sometimes need fine tuning. Because of the way the AF system works on the Z6, I'm looking for my Z6 here, um, because when you've got your Z6, there is no, in here, in case you've not seen the inside of a Z before, um, there is no AF system in front of the sensor. The sensor is the AF system, and I talked about this a little bit the other day. So with the D850 and those cameras, I'm going to need all my camera sensor clean by the time I finish this. This is going to be a sensor clean fund by the time I finish. Yay! Thank you, Jack. Wow. Woo. Party. <laughs> thank you very much for that. I am uh, definitely going to need my sensors cleaned with all the exposing I'm, I'm giving these bodies. So in a D850 or another DSLR, your AF system is actually located behind the bottom portion of the mirror. The bottom portion of the mirror you cannot see is uh, slightly opaque. Um, and the AF system reads through the bottom of the mirror. Um, it's like two little eyes and then it focuses on your subject and when the subject is aligned according to your eyes, your AF system, um, then it tells the sensor, or it tells the camera that it's in focus and then you can take your picture. It's a far more complicated system, but that's why focusing is a little bit faster. So, um, now I do have to, um, yes, I have to bring up the point of live view now. <laughs> 
AF fine tuning, because of this system where you have a mirror in front of your AF system, if you take a picture in live view on your camera, it will undoubtedly be sharper than if you don't uh, use live view. The reason for that is that live view is essentially a direct feed off the sensor and you are not using that dual AF system, which is why you generally don't need to AF fine tune on these Z cameras because the focus points are on the sensor, so you don't need to. So if you are gonna um, fine tune your cameras, and your lenses together, you can use live view, but you will not get the same value of fine tune as you will if you're using the viewfinder. If you're using the viewfinder, you will undoubtedly need a tiny bit of fine tuning. And now I'm just gonna show you what that fine tune menu looks like. Hopefully you're all tracking so far. So in that menu option that I talked about, the first option at the top there is AF fine tune on or off. Obviously you would wanna turn it on. So I'm gonna just do that for now, even though this lens doesn't actually need it. Um, then the next option down is saved value, which you can't clearly see until I show you. The next option down there, saved value. All right, so in saved value, this is where it shows you, uh, let's get the angle right here. So we've got the 35 1.4, it shows me that that's the lens attached. And then I have my little focusing sort of line there. And then you can dial in your value. You can either go forward or backwards. What I tend to do when I'm AF fine tuning is take it in increments of five, which are like big chunky increments on this on this little line here. And then once I look like I'm getting closer and closer to the actual fine tuning amount, then I start to really get down to the single uh, single little lines. It goes, it's really difficult to see unfortunately on this camera. I can try and hold it up as much as I can. But you see you've got the long line there and you've got those tiny little slightly longer um, lines that's increments of five so it goes uh, 5 10 15 20 so plus up to plus 20 and then minus 5 10 15 20. If your lens will not fine-tune beyond plus or minus 20 then you need to get it calibrated so that's another way to know whether or not your camera needs servicing. Um, the, uh, the idea is that you would take each of your lenses you would check them with the focusing chart you would narrow down the amount of fine tuning you need, the camera will save that value for each of your lenses. So you can actually program all of your lenses in there. I don't have any value saved at the moment, but I think you can save up to something like 20 lenses or something. So there's, there's lo if you've got lots of lenses, you can do that. Obviously you wouldn't need to do this with manual focus lenses necessarily, because there's no way to save that information really. Um, the only reason you might want to do it is because sometimes the rangefinder dot in the bottom corner that tells you your subject is in focus can, can be a little bit off. Um, but that's more down to the fact that the lenses have perhaps uh, misaligned through use, just the age of the lens down to more than anything. But your eyes are a very good focusing aid. So for manual focus lenses, don't worry about it. Any lens that has a chip on the back like that, and a CPU chip, can be AF fine tuned. Um, the next point to mention is that the D5, D500, D850, I believe the D780 as well, and possibly the Zs, but I haven't looked, have automatic AF fine tune. This is a revelation. <laughs> it is so much easier to use the automatic AF fine tune. You essentially plonk the same system together with your focusing chart. You don't have to, mind you. Um, you could just focus on any object. But the reason we use these focusing charts is because they have black and white lines and it's nice and easy for the camera to use its contrast detect system to pick out that black line. It's not much good um, focusing on something too dark for the camera to focus or too bright for the camera to focus. So hence the black and white focusing chart. So you would set it up in exactly the same way, but instead of um, AF fine tuning, you've got an automatic AF fine tune function, uh, which is very, very handy. Um, that essentially means that the camera works out itself what uh, the, the value should be. Again, it can be a bit hit and miss, so you can do it a few times. Um, and that is all there is to it, really. There's nothing, there's nothing more to say. The automatic fine-tune, hurrah. Um, Nick says, wide-angle lenses seem to need less A of fine-tuning. Uh, yes, exactly. Wide-angle lenses don't. This is partially because wide-angle lenses have a 
a much uh, wider depth of field, even at the same aperture values than zoom lenses. Zoom lenses have a shallower depth of field because of their construction and because of the fact that they're zoom lenses. So 2.8 on a 14 millimeter lens is gonna give you a much wider depth of field than 2.8 on a 200 millimeter lens. It's just, it's just mathematics. So um, hence you shouldn't really need to fine tune much in the way um, of wide angle lenses, but you might need to fine tune a bit more than expected with zoom lenses. Um, the other thing that I wanted to make sure I mentioned was for, uh, fine tuning software. So some people, you're a little bit late Drazen, but it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Z camera doesn't have a fine tune option. I probably imagine that they don't need it. I've never looked on my Z cameras because I have never had a problem with the with front or back focusing at all on any Z camera. So that's that's probably why. But thanks for checking, Johan. I, thought, <laughs> I didn't want to check right now and sort of dive through the menus while I was uh, talking to you. Um, so the other thing that you can use if you are really, really into it, and I know a lot of people um, that do use this, is a fine tuning software called Focal, F-O-C-A-L. Um, and that is, you can buy a license for your camera. Um, this is what fixation use, for example, when they're checking um, calibration on cameras. You take a picture with the camera hooked up to your computer and then Focal, the software, actually tells you the value of fine tuning that's required. So if you wanted to be super, super, you know, sig significant about it and make sure that you get the exact amount of fine tuning required, um, then you could download something like Focal and uh, give it a whirl. You can um, spend hours doing things like this. <laughs> so <laughs> it's a great project <laughs> for uh, when you're stuck indoors. But um, as I say, it's only if you're noticing on your pictures that something is perhaps a little front or back focused or you're just um, missing, let's say, that sharpness of pic image and you think, oh, actually, I took a picture of the bird, but the branch behind it is the, always the thing in focus, even though the camera clearly shows that the focus point is on the bird and yet what's in focus is behind the bird. Now, that's the key point because obviously there is personal skill as well <laughs> we can't uh, we can't deny that the photographer has something to do with the process um, but if you are looking at a picture and you have a view in all editing software to look at where the focus point was um, and if the focus point for example if I was taking a picture of a person and the focus point showed that it was on their eye but what's actually in focus is the tip of their ear which is a small distance but is actually quite a lot to need to fine tune, then I would know, for example, that there was something a little bit missing there. And you will get hit and miss sometimes, but if it's happening consistently and it's a frustration point for you, then then do have a look at AF fine tuning, just because it might be helpful. So if you find that your AF fine tuning is above or below plus or minus 20, then you can send everything off to a service center um, and Nikon will recalibrate it for you. Um, as Nick was saying, yes, the Zs have AF fine tuning, but not auto AF fine tuning. That's um, it's just a feature that they've put in some of the newer DSLRs. I I didn't see why they would have auto AF fine tuning in the Z cameras. As I say, just the the focusing system is very, very different. Um, for people who ever had a D800E, for example, that I mean, not to talk about Nikon rumors and things like that, but there was a period where the first few D800Es that rolled off the line had slightly incorrect um, AF values plugged into them. So that essentially someone in the factory who'd been calibrating the cameras on the left-hand sensor, AF sensor, had um, put the wrong value. I don't know how this happens, but anyway, it happened. So it was slightly out of sync. So Nikon would then recalibrate your D800E for free um, if you had a D800E, but it just meant that, and most people don't use the left hand AF sensor, they're usually using the right hand one if they're doing portrait, so you wouldn't always notice unless you do your portraits like this, <laughs> which you can, and some people do, um, but essentially if you were finding that a portion of your picture was out of focus, then it was a very specific problem. Generally speaking, what you want to make sure is that when you're using this focusing chart and my printer is a little bit dodgy, but you might be able to see this, uh, the black line that's down here, this writing says, uh, this text should be perfectly in focus. So you should, when you use a focusing chart like this, have clear focus all the way across the line, provided that you um, are completely straight on 
with this chart, it's a 45 degree angle and the camera is pointing straight at it, then that whole line of text in that plane of focus should be in focus for you. So there you have it. Uh, where to get your camera serviced, when to get it done, what's worth doing, what's not worth doing and what you can do yourself in terms of AF fine tuning. Uh, hopefully that has been useful information for you. Um, I'm going to just uh, talk once again a little bit about our drive folder because some of you uh, were a little bit stuck on where to put things in the drive folder so I'm going to show you exactly where to put it once I've pulled it up preparation is fantastic just one moment here we go so oh it's taking a second to load here we are so let me switch over my screen so this is our our infamous drive folder here is the competition folder for film photography and some of you have been very busy uploading your photos and thank you so so much for doing it so far um just a reminder so if you want to comment on an image for example you would just, once it shows up, there we go, you just click on this little thing to add your comment and then you can, this is a beautiful portrait. Um, and that is all there is to it, to leave your vote and your comment. Um, one thing that I ought to say about film and buying film, the company that I was talking about, Analog Wonderland, um, do have a little sort of discount code with Grays, which I think we put at the bottom of our last feed, which is Grays underscore 10. Uh, so you can get 10% off anything you buy from Analog Wonderland if you use that code. And I would recommend doing that because it's always useful to have a discount off film. Um, that is it from me today. So um, I have more questions. There's quite a lot of questions stacking up, but I also have to not lose my voice so that I can do streams every day. Um, I want to thank everybody who um, did a contribution to the a coffee cup of tea fund for Grey's of Westminster today. It is so superb of all of you. Thank you very, very much. Um, if you need any tips or if I forgot to put any links in, let me know and we will add those. You can always email me your questions. Um, this one came through a comment to this topic, but you can always email me your questions as well. Very straightforward. It's just becky at graysofwestminster.co.uk. I mean, we're really easy to get hold of. So if you want to leave a comment, I will also look at those. But I will find another topic for tomorrow. I've got a few in store, but some of them require a little bit more uh, <laughs> workout. <laughs> so now I will love you and leave you. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you so much for tuning in. And I will see you again very soon for another stream.